get that going. And Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. We'll probably give it a minute or two before getting started just to let people trickle in. But we're really excited uh, to have you here for our panel today. Hello again, as I see some people trickling in, um, I see we're at 43 participants. So I think we're gonna just, and uh, there's still a few more rolling in. So I'm just gonna keep repeating. I think I'll wait just like one more minute before we get started, just to make sure we have people in. Um, then look forward to getting the conversation rolling. Start at two after. All right, welcome, welcome. I'm seeing the numbers sort of start to tail off here. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. Um, welcome, uh, thank you for joining us for uh, today's webinar. My name is Ethan Gates. I am the Software Preservation Analyst at Yale University Library and the user support lead for the easy um, emulation as a service infrastructure program of work. Um, easy is hosted at Yale University Library and supported by the Andrew Mellon and Alfred P. Sloan Foundations. And I'm also joined in the background today by my co-facilitator, our easy community cultivation lead, um, Jessica Meyerson from Educopia Institute. And today we are super excited to be presenting uh, what we talk about when we talk about emulation. So I hope that's the talk that you're here to, to hear. Um, this is a roundtable discussion with Eric Kaltman, Tracy Pop, and Fernando Rios. And we hope this uh, to be the first in a series of roundtable discussions um, over about the next year and a half, um, covering the second round of funding, phase two of EASY's grant funding um, through 2022. Um, these discussions are going to touch on aspects of the EASY program's work and in particular emphasizing the theme of emulation in action, um, actual use cases and points and moments of interaction between researchers, um, digital archivists, uh, and digital preservation practitioners, digital curation, uh, and emulation technology in digital archives. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please go ahead and type them into the chat box in your Zoom control panel. Uh, Jessica Meyerson or I will be sure to keep an eye out and gather them and bring them up during um, our guided audience Q&A portion uh, uh, towards the end of this session. And also, if you haven't already, do please mute yourself and turn off your video to maximize the quality of the recording we are recording today. Um, and the panel is going to be made freely available um, in about a week with transcripts on the easy website that's on um, on the software preservation network.org. Uh, we are an affiliated project of software preservation network so you can find the easy website and all of our content there. Uh, so now I'm really excited to introduce our guest speakers. Um, First up, Eric Kaltman. Dr. Eric Kaltman is an assistant professor of computer science at California State University, Channel Islands. Uh, his research focuses on tools and methodologies for the historical analysis and exploration of software records. From 2014 to 2018, he managed the IMLS funded game metadata and citation project. And before coming to Cal State, 
he was a clear fellow for data curation at Carnegie Mellon uh, University Libraries. Tracy Pop is the digital preservation coordinator at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign University Library. And in support of preservation and access to digital collections, Ms. Pop leads the library's born digital collections preservation efforts. Uh, from 2018 to 2020, she represented the library's involvement in the Fostering a Community of Practice Software Preservation and Emulation Cohort, another affiliated project of the Software Preservation Network. And Ms. Pop holds a Master of Science and Certificate of Advanced Study in Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And last but not least, Fernando Rios is a Research Data Management Specialist in the Office of Digital Innovation and Stewardship, um, ODIS, at the University of Arizona. And he focuses on supporting academic research in the areas of data management planning, research workflows, reproducibility, data and software curation, archiving and sharing, and open science. Um, and Fernando is additionally responsible for managing the University of Arizona Research Data Repository, ReData. So to kick things off, um, we're going to hear, we're going to take the first 15 minutes of, of the hour to hear a brief presentation from each panelist, about five minutes each, discussing a bit more about their particular work and perspective on emulation and software preservation. Um, just to give you a little bit more background about their specific experience before we head into our, our guided discussion. Um, so I'm going to start things off with Eric. Do you want to take the reins? Uh, sure. Yeah, I'll, um, I guess I'll share this and we'll get going. Hi, I'm Eric Altman, as I was just introduced. Um, I am, I have a couple of things to share. Uh, here we go. Can people see this? I like lost everything. Yeah. Yes. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So my, uh, my general work um, is I'm a, I'm a computer scientist, but I'm also a, a historian, right? So most of my applications for easy um, have been in, or easy and emulation have been with attempts to like reveal historical processes and enable historical critique of older software um, and computer games actually. Uh, and so in this brief talk, I'm just gonna talk about three projects that I have going on related to emulation directly, um, two of which are, are easy uh, related. Um, so the first one is um, embedded emulation in academic texts. Uh, as part of the uh, aforementioned game metadata and citation project in 2017, uh, me and a couple colleagues developed a prototypical interface for uh, citing emulations that are running in browser and then indexing their state for use in embedded articles. Um, and so this raised essentially questions about how you would actually use running computational state to enforce or reinforce arguments about the history of software or the history of interfaces or what have you. Um, and so our you know, fun, fantastic looking prototype tool uh, allowed you to run a emulator in one window and then actually save the state and record live video of the emulation in browser. Um, and we have managed to, after a year and a half, uh, get a demo of this running in um, an upcoming digital humanities quarterly article. Uh, and so I know this is always absolutely terrifying to do this type of stuff live, but um, here, so this is a, the editorial area for Digital Humanities Quarterly, and we have an emulator running. Um, and I can click on this text and wait a second. And I am now in the opening of the game Wolfenstein 3D. Uh, and then if I click here, I am now in a specific location in Doom, right? So it can jump between programs. And this article is about uh, a, a game study scholar describing the structure of a level in Doom. And so instead of just reading about it, you can actually jump into the text at specific points. And I'm going to close this before it does something weird. OK. Um, uh, where is my PowerPoint? Oh, I have to turn the PowerPoint back on. Apologies. Where did it go? Share, whatever, I'll just share the screen. Okay. Um, and so as we see, we are kind of clicking around, right? Um, and so the questions that came up here was how we actually, you know, make use of running emulation to support historical understanding of software. And you could see this being used for like chronologies of user interfaces or all sorts of other types of applications. Um, feel free to ask me about them. Um, the second 
uh, project was in an experimental archaeologies of CAD course at uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon University's Department of Architecture or School of Architecture um, in collaboration with Professor Daniel Cardoso Latch. Um, we included easy emulation as part of a historical analysis of CAD course in which students first reconstructed historical systems with their with modern uh, programming um, and then emulated historical systems and use these experiences to kind of create speculative designs for novel um, computer assisted design interfaces right and so we tried to track how historically practices changed in architecture from you know giant drafting tables to the introduction of AutoCAD specifically um, which is one of the main tools used in the industry um, and so students were actually able to load up legacy versions of the AutoCAD software and other types of visualization systems. Um, this is Vista Pro, which was a uh, polygonal, you know, landscape generator that was used for like book covers and magazine covers back in the day. Um, and so students spent time in easy. Um, in one case, a student spent about 10 hours in Maya uh, reconstructing models just to see how it actually related to, you know, current uses of the interface. Um, and we have a lot of uh, pending work on uh, lessons learned and things that came out of running easy in a class setting. Um, uh, most significant of which being that students, some of them seem to actually prefer the simpler interfaces of the earlier programs. Um, the last project, just so I can wrap this up because I don't actually know where I am on time, um, is uh, the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon um, is one of the premier uh, interactive arts programs in the country. Um, and they have allowed me to mess with around 20 terabytes of their project data from the last 20 years, which includes uh, games, interactive theater, amusement, like park installations and novel UI interfaces. Um, and my current project that's active is seeing if it's possible to actually use easy to resurrect project documentation from legacy projects, right? A lot of these uh, installations were designed for like Adobe Flash or earlier versions of the Unity game engine. Um, most of which are now completely unavailable, right? So we have to kind of resurrect historic production environments to see how things were actually designed and built um, in, you know, the mid 2000s through the mid 2010s, because um, the, the progress of software kind of goes. Um, and so the next step in this project is actually a requirements analysis with um, people who teach um, entertainment and interactive design to see what they would actually want to use a emulation support system for if they could recover older project documentation and show their students how things like used to work. Um, and I think that's this basically is, my time. That's fantastic, Eric. Thank you so much. Um, perfect overview. <laughs> and we're already getting great discussion going on in the, in, in the chat. So I'm loving this. Thanks. Um, yeah, we're. I mean, we're going to have plenty of time for for questions and and to go dive deeper on some of those projects. But now I want to hand over to to Tracy to talk, give her a chance to talk about her work. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, let me get this going. And can everyone see the PowerPoint? Okay. I'm going to assume that was a yes. We, we, we can. We can see your speaker view, I think. Oh, you can see my Tracy. speaker view. OK, that's not what <laughs> we want to see. Yeah. No. All right. Uh, shoot. Sorry. No problem. We're all juggling a single monitor. Yeah, it's way too many. Home. There are <laughs> way too many windows. You'd think I would have figured it out by now, but <laughs> that is not the case. All right. I'm just going to go with this. So, great. Uh, yeah. So, I'm Tracy Pop. I'm digital preservation coordinator at the uh, University Library at the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. Um, I'll just start out with giving you some context of you know our, our situation in a large academic library. Um, and I'll talk about um, my experiences with the uh, fostering a community of practice um, software emulation or software preservation and emulation um, in, in the project that I did through that and some of the um, lessons learned and uh, future work that I'm looking at. So um, I am situated in the preservation services unit in uh, the university library. The university library itself is a, a large 
um, academic library uh, where we have a lot of uh, sort of siloed um, or independent units um, that are working in, you know, general collections. Um, I most often work with special collections materials. So when we're receiving materials from um, our university archives or any of the museums or uh, rare book and manuscript library um, within our library, um, I'll most often work with them because that's where we're receiving a lot of our unique material that I might uh, need to recover uh, from removable computer media. Um, so I manage uh, the Born Digital Media Reformatting Lab within the Preservation Services Unit where I maintain a host of um, you know, a host of hardware in order to read these media um, and recover uh, collections from um, these fragile and, and uh, obsolete media. Um, so when I got into that and began to work with collections, um, it became very quickly apparent that I would need a variety of uh, rendering software in order to do anything meaningful or provide access or migrate or anything like that in order to um, work with this content. Um, and fortuitously around 2014, I was um, contacted by a community member who had a very large uh, collection of software that they wanted to donate to the library. And that's sort of how I got into, you know, looking at emulation and software preservation was through that prompt. Um, but I was really interested in expanding that beyond, you know, a research or, a, a, you know, a single use application. So um, I had the opportunity in 2017, 2018 uh, to apply for the Fostering a Community of Practice project um, and was uh, fortunately selected for that. Um, and for that particular project, uh, I focused on uh, a couple collections related to uh, contemporary music composers, um, music production tools uh, that came from our Sousa Archives and Center for American Music collections. So um, I was looking specifically at software titles uh, related to musical scores, um, such as Avid uh, Finale, um, and Avid Pro Tools, so uh, score uh, creation tools as well as musical recording tools. Um, the idea here was to begin to pilot and prioritize emulation research and practice. Um, so I had done, like I said, some uh, more research based work and I was looking for um, a, a way to make that more, uh, yeah, sorry, make that more, uh, scalable. Uh, so I, you know, develop workflows and um, with the intent of preserving or improving pre preservation and access. Um, so halfway through the project, um, I started out with cl three collections, quickly realized that I needed to scale that back. Um, and what I ended up focusing on was uh, using a disk image created from a Macintosh PowerBook um, and focused on using easy uh, to access that disk image and using the emulator more of a processing tool. So seeing the content in situ, um, having a better understanding of what software was used to create it, um, create the files um, and just get a sense of that environment. So uh, lessons learned from the FCOP, um, really, you know, that importance of formalizing and scaling those workflows as well as reevaluation, um, you know, remaining flexible, uh, you know, I ran into roadblocks and often needed to flex and uh, reassess those strategies um, and the engagement across the projects and really making that um, uh, making that move to um, enculturate uh, emulation and, and software preservation across the library. So to wrap up, um, yeah, I'm continuing to engage in this capacity and others. Um, I'll be working uh, with Ethan and the spin folks uh, through the e easy hosted node pilot. Um, and then we'll continue uh, doing this kind of advocacy both internally and externally. So that's Thank what I have. Thank you so much, Tracy. Yeah, and I hope <laughs> maybe if we've got time to talk a little bit more about the hosted service pilot later um, in our discussion, that would be awesome. Um, and we're looking forward to working with you. Um, but for now, I'm going to move on to our, our last panelist, last but not least, Fernando. Um, do you want to talk to us a bit about your work with research data management and research software? 
yes, uh, and uh, yes and no. <laughs> Let me talk about this thing first. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah. So my uh, involvement with uh, emulation uh, at the U of A was uh, uh, through the FCOP project. So, uh, like Tracy, I want to talk a little bit first about that and and kind of what 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 we did there, uh, and then and then I, I kind of want to. Uh, maybe uh, like Ethan said, talk a little bit about the research data side of it. Um, but first, uh, so I will say to start off with that, uh, you know, emulation uh, doesn't uh, intersect greatly at this point with my day to day, but uh, my involvement with the FCOP uh, project is more of a, you know, kind of a personal interest. Um, so, so what we did with the project was um, uh, we wanted to, think through what it would look like to, uh, what a workflow would look like to preserve video games uh, using emulation uh, in partnership with the Learning Games Initiative Research Archive. And this is a research archive at the U of A. Um, it's distributed, but it's, it's kind of managed out of the U of A. Uh, that really, you know, collects a lot of video game artifacts, not only the games themselves, but uh, things like, you know, magazines or or merchandise, uh, publications, magazines, and so forth, um, to, to really get at the experience of, of the video game. And, that, and that's really the underlying ethos of the, the archive is, is this notion of preservation through use. So, you know, really getting down and, and, and touching the thing that you're studying and, you know, and physically interacting with it. Uh, Feeding, feeding out of that is kind of exploring how, how as a group we could uh, kind of collect knowledge and, and disseminate knowledge around uh, emulation kind of at the local level. And by local, I mean, you know, at the, at the University of Arizona level uh, through, through an interest group. So what we envisioned was a, a community of practice at the U of A to foster discussions and illuminate challenges related to software preservation, especially related to video games. Uh, with a view towards bridging local gaps and knowledge and practice. And, and this bridging part, I think, was the most interesting part to me uh, because I, I, I don't have a background in digital preservation. I come from uh, the research side of things. So, you know, kind of thinking through some of the issues uh, around communication of emulation to different communities and different groups of people is something that, that, uh, that I was interested in. Um, so uh, digging a little bit more of, uh, about what we did with uh, the, the archive, um, here we have uh, one of our collaborators, uh, Ken McAllister. He's one of the coordinators of, of the archive itself. Um, and you can see that we, you know, the archive not only has, uh, you know, shelves of video games, but also, you know, a lot of uh, just stuff from the era, you know, that, that relates to it. Like, you know, you have these special edition um, consoles, there's, uh, you know, magazines, playing cards, um, advertising that was used for the, for the game. So really kind of this one holistic view, uh, view towards interacting with a, with, a, with a game and it's all it's associated materials in, in, in this uh, preservation through use philosophy. Uh, as you can imagine though, this preservation through use philosophy can impact uh, the longevity of the games that uh, are, are in the archive. Um, so what'll happen is that uh, somebody will request a game and they'll physically send out a copy to them. Um, now, you can imagine things might get lost or damaged in the process. So one thing that we want to look at is how can we incorporate emulation uh, into uh, Legira's um, workflow to, to kind of try to mitigate some of that risk. So what we decided to do is uh, focus on the Commodore 64. Uh, the, the archive has a lot of, uh, you know, pretty good Commodore 64 collection. Um, they also have a few uh, consoles and, and uh, peripherals that we had available to us. Um, here we are uh, taking one of the drives apart, which wasn't reading uh, the, the disks correctly. Um, so that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, and then uh, once we got some of that working, you know, we picked a, a few games to try to try to image and emulate and, and put up into the easy emulation platform to see how they'd work. Um, one of the outputs that came out of that was uh, a workflow that was developed by the, the 
FCOP project leader, Monique, uh, which is, she's no longer at the UBA, but um, she, she uh, did the bulk of the work here uh, on uh, documenting what we did and, and coming up with a, an imaging workflow for the Commodore 64. Um, of course, uh, you know, the imaging and the emulation part is only a small part of, of the, the archives workflow. Um, so here, here's uh, kind of the, the full picture, so to speak. Um, the question that we had was, you know, how do you communicate what happens in a workflow like this uh, to audiences that are not uh, in archives or are not digital preservationists? And that was really the part that, that, I, that intersected the most with my work in research data management. Um, so in research data management, um, you know, one of the things that I think about a lot is, uh, you know, when I help people archive their, their research data um, for sharing and publication, what else needs to happen so that the data is usable? Like what software needs to be in place? Like how do you ensure that the data uh, can be used um, and, and the results that, that are in, in the paper can be reproduced? So that's the mentality that um, a lot of researchers have. Uh, this is a session that we had that we held uh, on emulation uh, in Legira in the archive. Uh, and the audience here is mostly actually research scientists. So what we did to kind of try to you know, bridge that gap between the archival and, and digital preservation world and the research world is, is uh, you know, use video games and this, re and this notion of preservation through use uh, uh, and that really, I think, resonated with people. We, we brought some items for show and tell. Um, the interesting part was the, the, the different way that researchers see the notion of preserving software. Um, you know, for them, it's mostly uh, they're interested in kind of being able to rerun somebody else's code. They're not always interested in, in, in the long-term access uh, of, the, of the software itself. Um, so that was one of the challenges uh, that we that we, uh, ran into, this kind of disconnect between the language and the, and the goals of preservation. Um, but that's something that, that, I, that I hope uh, we can uh, talk a little bit more about in the discussion. Yeah, Fernando, thanks. That's a perfect transition into our discussion, really. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, that was so awesome to hear from everyone. And I'm going to turn my video back on here so that we can um, move into our moderated discussion. Um, but just a note that again, that if anyone in the audience does have questions um, from what we've just heard in the past few minutes, uh, please just drop those at any point in the chat um, for the audience portion of our Q&A that we'll try and cover in the last 15, 10 minutes or so of the hour. Um, and we'll make sure they get directed to our wonderful panel. Um, so I, I, I as we talk about, you know, the theme of this <laughs> of this roundtable, what we talk about when we talk about emulation, you've already done a lot of talking about emulation <laughs> in various contexts here, and I almost want to back up for a minute and hear more about you individually in terms of like how you arrived at the work um, that you've talked about. Um, you know, how did you learn about emulation and software preservation? Um, concepts and terms, a direct question might just be like, when did you first learn what emulation was, period? Um, and was it in the course of these professional efforts or, or maybe somewhere else? Um, so I think uh, maybe, maybe we'll just go backwards here. Uh, if Fernando, if you want to ha handle that first. Um, sure. Uh, so I, I kind of arrived in the, in the emulation world. Um, I mean, I, I was aware of it and I've had a personal interest in it just outside of work, uh, just through, through video game emulation. But uh, on the professional level, coming in through it through uh, research data management, um, I think was was very interesting. Um, so when I first started it, do, doing it and thinking about it, I, I, I didn't really know that there's a whole other world of you know archives that had a totally different view of, of what emulation was supposed to do and, and what it was. Um, and uh, I, I will say that you know even even the word emulation can mean different things to different people. Um, I mean, to to me, uh, to me, like an, an, emul an emulator was like something that uh, you know uh, reran the instructions of, of a particular console in a in a in a, in a kind of a, 
a wrapper, say, around a particular software. Whereas I've seen, you know, the word emulation used in different ways uh, to mean everything from what I just said to, to containerization to virtual machines. Um, and I think when, when talking about emulation to audiences like researchers, that's the side of things that they think of. Um, they're not so interested in emulating uh, software because you know it's just too slow to emulate things to run scientific applications, but it's more of how do I just run this thing? Um, so that's kind of kind of how I landed in it and in my from my viewpoint, that's how it is. Yeah, it's interesting. I think you bring up the point of like emulation both being a very specific tool and very specific definition to some people, but also having this sort of broad sense of recreation, emulation of of you know computing emulating someone is just means you know i want to do what that thing or that person does um so we, we you can come at it from a bunch of different angles there um tracy what, what what was your experience when did you encounter emulation was it video games i wonder if that's going to be the answer for everyone um yeah i guess to one extent it was video games but it was primarily through digital artwork um so i have um my undergrad is in photography and digital media um, and I spent a good amount of time in my master's and um, my master's work looking at internet art and, you know, preservation of those kind of things, as well as um, some of the case studies that came out of Rhizome. Um, and then, you know, that was, I think, my first real explor exploration or introduction into uh, emulation beyond just, you know, video games or anything like that. Um, and then there was the practical application of, you know, just providing access to collections material for, you know, purposes of assessment of, you know, determining what this is, do we want to retain it? Um, you know, very basic practical on the ground <laughs> application uh, for collection management. So, you know, it, and it's always been a, sort of a process of trial and error, as well as iterating through as the technology becomes available, as the time becomes available, you know, a, a management of resources, um, you know, where I had the opportunity to really focus on, um, uh, emulation as a viable, um, implementable, sustainable practice was through the FCOP, uh, and I'm hoping, you know, continued engagement with EZ and uh, will help to continue to, uh, you know, develop that, that service here at the library and make that, you know, a sustainable sort of practice. Yeah, I, I appreciate you bringing up resources because it, and, and the project, because it, brings up the idea of like professional development and needing the time to, to sit down and learn these concepts and mm -hmm. how much people do that actually in on the job or, or as a hobbyist. Um, that's, that's always a tension, I guess, in the library community, archival community in general, but certainly here. Um, and just to, just to hear from you, Eric, how about, how about you? How did you come to emulation? Um, well, I mean, I was, as, a, as like a lifelong video game person, right? Like I, I was, you know, using Nintendo emulators in the 90s, like in the late 90s, right? When they first started being shared, like ROM sharing on the internet and all that type of stuff. Um, professionally though, it came in um, when I was starting up uh, graduate school um, in, in CS, I had been working at Stanford with their collection of, of the Cabernet collection at Stanford, which has a massive collection of video games. Um, and just realizing that there was essentially not really a good way to access any of this stuff. Um, and that was one of the impetuses for the, the game and game metadata and citation project. And then as a result of that project, the uh, uh, people who had been running Olive, which is the uh, another emulation you know, service framework that was earlier, if people aren't familiar with CMU's Olive system, um, and the progenitor to easy uh, BWFLA uh, were in the orbit at that time because we were just talking to everyone about how you would potentially use um, citation and and practices like that to to get access to it, um, and so that was essentially where that came in for me um, professionally. And then we decided to start just exploring actually using emulation um, going forward, which became important at Carnegie Mellon when we got involved in the Easy Project. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh... There's some fascinating stuff in the Cabernetti collection. I just know from conversations and I know Stanford is part of the easy project and I know that's 
um, a collection that we're hoping to also expose a little bit more ultimately through the Easy Project as well. Um, so we, we've mentioned the, the FCOP um, project, the Fostering Community Practice um, grant uh, uh, program um, through Soccer Preservation Network a couple of times. And uh, a resource that, that I wanted to particularly like highlight in this conversation, and maybe um, Jessica will be able to grab the link in the background here, was um, Dr. Amelia Acker's paper, research paper that um, came out of that. I think it's in preprint on the concept of emulation encounters and kind of the broad number of ways that emulation can come into play in libraries, archives, in museums. Um, and I think we've already heard this play out from the three of you in some interesting ways in terms of um, putting emulation in front of, uh, of various different user groups and, and possibly in ways um, that they I mean, sort of as Fernando mentioned, like may, might not even <laughs> think of as emulation or, or, or be focused on as emulation, but um, you know, but it, but it is in some ways an emulation, uh, an encounter, even if it's behind the scenes, even if there's a, a, a tool, um, you know, being used to as a means to an end um, to help a, 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 a user, a patron, a student, a researcher with their use case. Um, so I want to dig a little bit more into those like use case conversations that you have with um, those people who, you know, maybe don't have the background that you have, um, that you just described, like that, you know, you have to do some work of socialization and, and, and introduction to, um, I mean, what kind of questions do they ask and, and, and how much work, I guess, do, do you have to explain what emulation is to them at all in the course of these projects or is, are they just sort of like focused on, on, on the result? Um, if anyone wants to jump in on that, or I, or I can um, on some on some common questions from your use cases, or I can direct. I see Tracy un, un, unmuting, so maybe. Yeah, um, I guess I Thank can you. say about um, it's often driven by you know the the end interest in access to whatever extent that means. Does that mean patron access? Does that mean access in terms of can you can an archivist see this to make appraisal decisions but out of that there's also this notion of like around emulation and it's often approached very sort of hand wavy of like you know oh we'll just emulate that without the consideration of what does it take to emulate something and what kind of work has to go into that so um yeah it's been an interesting um challenge to kind of think about you know unpacking that term of emulation and what that means, um, you know, what that means to someone of like hearing from them of like, okay, when you say emulation, what do you mean? And, you know, what, <laughs> what are you interested in, in developing and maintaining of that? So, um, you know, a, a lot of conversations just come from pairing the idea of like, this is what I, this is the end result that I would like. And I'm hearing a solution called emulation, and that's what we think we want, but, you know, kind of backing away from that to get a, a, a greater understanding of is emulation the tool that we need? What is the, you know, what are the tools that we have? What's the understanding, um, you know, and that's, that seems to be how those conversations arise to, you know, around, you um, you know, not necessarily emulation. Emulation in each case has not mm -hmm. always been the best tool, or but there's always that that notion or that word that pops up. So, how about you, Eric? Like, how in the weeds do you have to get like with? You it know, really depends on yeah. like the the use case and context of the person who I'm interacting with, right? Like, I have had at Carnegie Mellon, I had some use cases where I had a student come to me and just needed to access like a DBase file from some CD, the National Archives Center. That was from like 1997 and I got it working, right? She didn't care about, like there was no conceptual discussion of emulation. There was nothing. I just managed to get it running for her so she could look at it, right? There wasn't really questions about, you know, what, whether or not this, how this was possible, anything like that, right? She was just happy to get the information. Um, for the for the coursework that we did, it was also, you know, it's depending, we were just using it as a tool, as a form of analysis in the course, right? So we told them that this was being emulated and we gave them access to the system. 
Um, but legitimating the concept of emulation to them was not nothing that we needed to really cover. Um, and most of them being younger, were familiar with just video game emulation as general as a term or a thing that happened, right? But the, um, the technical underpinning of it was actually not really that you know, in, important to them. Um, I will say in discussing this with, um, with people in like computer science world, like you have to actually be very specific about how you're talking about emulation in that context, because in, in computer science, there's emulation is a general process for doing all sorts of things, right? Not just um, software emulation, but network emulation, hardware emulation, like there's actually like categories of practice. And so when I talk to that field, I actually couch it in the language of the preservation community and say that I'm coming at this from library science and, and that area so that when we're using emulation is actually less specific than in their context, right? Um, which yeah. ends up being a thing, right? I had to actually write a definition of emulation for a paper for them. And that took a little bit because like I had to figure out how to actually couch it in like, I'm doing this type of emulation for this type of process as opposed to you know, any sort of other emulation that you get if you look into the computer science literature. Yeah, that's. I'd like to kick that back to Fernando because it gets back to some things you mentioned about um, research data management, you know, not being necessarily interested in the technical underpinnings, but they're also like meaning very specific things. I know in, in reproducibility world, you're literally talking about perhaps containerization or virtualization instead of emulation. Um, do, do you want to elaborate on that? Like how, again, like to what degree do people need to, in, in your circle and your experience, need to sift through these particular words and topics or are they just looking to run run something? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's basically what 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 uh, we found. Um, kind of echoing what Eric said. Uh, you know, most people are interested in. I need to do X and get Y. I don't care how it happens. <laughs> um, so, you know, talking about emulation and video games. I think you know in the session that we had. Uh, in that sl last slide that I showed, it was interesting to people, but it was hard, I think, for them. And, you know, I sense in the discussion that we had, it was hard, hard for them to connect how their work could benefit from the things that we were talking about. So unless uh, you put it in into terms that they care about, like if you do, if, if you take this approach, you can do that. And here's how you do it. Uh, they're less, less interested in, in like the uh, things that you know digital preservationists might be interested about. Um, I mean, they, they wouldn't care about metadata. They just need to get the thing done and that's what matters. Yeah, it, it's a struggle for us in the emulation as a service infrastructure project, which is specifically pitching <laughs> uh, emulation front and center to like work out that sometimes that tension of, of still like, trying to push a certain technology as a as an option as a strategy you know in the toolbox of, of archives and preservation um but to couch you know how do we how do we phrase how do we adjust like that we're we're ta talking to our target um you know audience who could benefit or maybe a different strategy is better for them but um wa walking that line of, of of like making it available but making sure you're listening to actually what the people coming to you need help with um, and we're going to do some fantastic questions from the audience at this point, actually. So I want to make sure we, we get to those and this is a great time to move over to that. So, uh, here, this is probably a, a pretty quick one, um, that I can, can pitch to the group from Sharon Mizota. We have, has anyone worked with emulation for CGI filmmaking or animation assets out of this group? Um, I am going to do that. Uh, in, in the in the in the data set that I was talking about in my research, right? There's a bunch of animation projects, um, uh, specifically in like older versions of like Render Man from Pixar and like other types of things, right? Um, as far as emulation of three dimensional models and stuff, I think there's actually a bit of work there. Um, off the top of my head, I can't give you a, a ton of projects, right? But I know that in in architectural world, there's a lot of stuff doing modeling and and recovery of models through emulation there. Um, and that um, there is in, I guess, like 3D community stuff, like getting old 3D models running, right? I don't know of any specific animation projects, though. 
Um, but I'm not going to say that there aren't any. And I'll actually keep it with you for a second there, Eric, because we've got a question specifically for you uh, from Kit Arrington about your CAD classroom project. Was Who was in the class? Was it a class of aspiring architects, um, historians, maybe computer science students? What was the what was the goal of the professor? Uh, so specifically, it was in the computational design department inside the School of Architecture at, at Carnegie Mellon, and it was a graduate course. So these are all people who are doing graduate studies in architecture and computational design specifically for architecture. Um, the professor, Daniel Cardoso, uh, is a uh, essentially a science and technology studies person and a former you know, architect. So I'd say three of the students in the class were previously professional architects who were coming back to using older versions of AutoCAD after having like expert professional level experience with modern versions. Um, and the, the purpose of the class is essentially to do uh, various types of what's termed as experimental archeologies span or like experimental historical methodologies to kind of see what we can figure out through different ways of trying to know older software, right? So the students did reconstruction work where they'd use like JavaScript and modern web APIs to reconstruct older historical systems based on documentation. Um, and then in the next part of the course, we had them directly use the emulation so that they could work with the older interfaces and then have some sort of reflective practice based on that. So, I mean, it was historical reflective, but all the students in the course were um, people who are interested in like computational design at a graduate level for, for architecture. And uh, am I recollecting that some of those students might have written some like blog posts, even like as part of the coursework that are available that Maybe that's yeah, not I the was thing actually we'll look trying for, to but, yeah. seriously try and find that. Um, we had um, one, a couple of the students put up posts about what they had done. And then there's actually a consolidated document um, that is all of the coursework for the class. So the students produced essentially like each three short papers on each section of the course. And so um, I can figure out a way to disseminate that. Um, I was trying to find it. I just need to know the actual, I have to get the actual link from Danielle because I think it's somewhere in his orbit of of space right but um right. it's a full course description and like everything that we did thanks that'd be really amazing to share if we can get that out to everyone yeah um i've got a question for tracy you mentioned formalization of emulation workflows um do you have an example or two where documenting workflows proved to be important um or where you wish you'd done more documentation formalization of your workflows um um, yeah, I think uh, in terms of anything that we have published, um, Jessica shared that out through the FCOP site. Um, what I am undertaking right now is we have a, 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 a very large workflow review project um, that I'm working with my colleagues from Special Collections on right now. Um, and one area that we're really focusing on, this is greater than emulation per se, but it's an appraisal process. Um, and as part of that, I want to um, include things like, um, as we're going through the appraisal, thinking about what kind of materials uh, one might want to consider when thinking about emulation. So um, having some sort of decision tree um, that we can you know, that's even distilled at, at upfront as, as, as much as we can distill to share with our archivists or collections, folks that are doing acquisitions so that they can think about, okay, say this donor has an entire computer system, um, that might be a use case where we may not necessarily do, you know, emulate that system, but if we can capture that information upfront and at the time, um, as early as possible, that gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of what is done uh, for preservation or access purposes in the future. So, I mean, there's cases where um, I'm also going out into the field with folks um, and I can make those sort of, you know, assessments when I'm looking at a, a system and say like, okay, well, it looks like, you know, just kind of assess what software is there. Um, and to make that sort of on the fly decision of we're going to image for the possibility of emulation. So, you know, I, the workflows themselves are very broad, but the intent is to make them um, as widely applicable and easily sort of uh, digestible um, so that, you know, we retain as much flexibility as we can. But um, yeah, there's the FCOP stuff, and there is also, um, 
uh, once I have more formalized workflows, um, I'll have those up in our um, University of Illinois wiki that is, I'm working on updating that, so. <laughs> That's a, you've raised the question of documentation and assessment, which I think leads really well into our last question here. Um, we have someone who's really curious about the context of archival operations. How do you talk with archivists, um, probably, or like your fellow curators, colleagues, about determining when the significant properties of a born digital collection demand the overhaul and the resources of emulation? Um, uh, Fernando, I wonder if that's something that you'd be interested in in going addressing first from the research data side. Um, you know, how when you get a deposit in the repository, how do you determine what the significant properties are and how are you going to work with that moving forward? I think that's an interesting question to dig into. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't think we're even at the level, and by we, I mean the research data management community as a whole are at the level of having researchers come knocking on our doors asking for these kinds of services. I mean, there might be certain niche cases, but at least for stuff that we get into the repository, we, we, do, we do get software in the form of uh, code, like source code for scripts of, of uh, you know, supporting papers. Um, we do look at the source code, but uh, I mean, we we haven't seen any reason to dig any deeper than that as far you know like apart from making sure there's a license there um and a title of what this thing and a description of what this thing does i mean I, i'd love for there to be uh you know a, a demand for that sort of thing because i think recording these significant properties of software like um you know the a more detailed uh documentation of what dependencies are needed to run it. Um, uh, you know, if, if there are any external data sources that are used, um, it's important to record. But, uh, you know, right now we just haven't seen that, that demand for that kind of thing. And, you know, we do have limited staff. Um, so, I mean, in total, like cobbled together out of, uh, you know, two to three FTEs, we have like one, one, one person out of these, <laughs> these uh, three people kind of working on the data repository. The, the so, limited so, staff question always raises the issue, right? I mean, we're talking about socializing and talking with colleagues, but like, what if you don't have someone to talk about this <laughs> right. with directly, which, which can happen? Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, I think it's important on a philosophical level, um, but there are also other important things. <laughs> yeah. So it's a matter of yeah. what, you know, what wins over what. Yeah, I see Tracy. I've seen you nodding a lot here. Do you, do you want to chime in with your perspective? Yeah, it's just the the normal, you know, trying to socialize. Um, it seems to be for me, you know, based on those resources, just kind of on the ground as I can, kind of when there's uh, <laughs> when there is that interest or. Um, any opportunity there is to have that discussion, just to kind of continue to seed as I can, because, you know, yeah, I'm a, a person of one working on porn digital preservation and trying to, you know, gain, um, advocate for <laughs> continuing to develop our services as we can, so. Um. Got a question from Jack Hill is work on format migration in scope for emulation um, so that say historical projects data models etc could be used in part of uh, larger systems of contemporary software um, it's a interesting the emulation via migration use case I think basically is what um, we're, we're bringing up here does has anyone experimented with that I think Tracy you've talked about uh, emulation yeah. as archival assessment and possible processing tool. Yeah, it's definitely, um, you know, something that I'm focused on is using the emulator as a migration, um, as a migration environment. Um, and I believe there is the UVI that I have forgotten what that stands for, but it is, um, it is uh, supposed to help with migration, uh, making that more automated, but um, particularly thinking about the various audio production environments that I have, they often um, require that sort of hopping through 
versions of software, um, particularly with the um, the Macintosh computer that I imaged from the mid '90s. Mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, I was unable to open some of those files in contemporary uh, current software versions. So, you know, that use of the emulator um, really helped in, you know verifying what the content is, what, you know, getting a greater sense of what the uh, significant properties might be or dependencies, um, and then thinking about how to migrate those forward. Yeah, and I'll just I'll quickly clarify the UVI, the, the Universal Virtual Interactor is one of the pieces of the Easy Program of Works development, which is essentially an automation API for taking input files and automatically identifying both their dependencies and and finding those dependencies and providing the item back in emulation. So, um, and, and thereby, you know, possibly the ability to export out in a, in a different save as or export format um, and get that returned. Um, so for just automating some of these processes that I think we're talking about doing just in a very manual way right now in, as a service improvement. Um, uh, we're, we're running, I'm sorry, we're running a little low on time. You all have such amazing questions. Um, and I'm sure all of our panelists are available, um, you know, to, to, to contact out of this panel if we, if, if with, with, with follow-ups, if we don't get to every single one of them. Um, uh, there was a question from Eliza. Is there a resource of suggested language to clarify the scope of emulation within the archival context versus computer science context? Does anyone have 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 suggestion of good resources for talking about emulation, pointing people for the dis, to the distinctions? Um, the one that I use the most is uh, David Rosenthal from Stanford's um, emulation and virtualization as preservation strategies, which was the report he did in 2015 um, for uh, oh some large funder. I, I totally forget who commissioned that, but I, I think it was Mellon. <laughs> Mellon, yeah, our fellow yeah. Mellons, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's I I actually take the um, the definitional structures from there because it it kind of he he glosses over the the some of the technical specifications but like some of the technical differences between virtualization and emulation get really murky and so in his definition he's kind of like well we're just going to pretend that that's not you know like for our specific use case like you're you're talking about running older software through some sort of other piece of software um and doing some sort of conversion of instruction set you know and that's that's kind of what i've been using um at least to talk to CS people about like the specific context, right? Yeah. Um, going the other way, uh, it'd be hard, right? Because the, I mean, the history of emulation, like the first emulation stuff, starts in like the mid 1960s, right? With 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 porting different programs from different mainframe systems um, around, and so there's there's a lot of of stuff involving emulation in CS that you'd really have to decide like exactly how you're defining it for the specific context of of the use in CS, right? So the one that I use. Is I the one is this basically like David Rosenthal's general discussion of it is the one I found that's been the most helpful. That's great. Before before I totally wrap up, there's like if we can quickly squeeze this in, there's one question I have like for for all of you before we finish, which is just, you know, what's a key takeaway from this panel that you know that you would like every attendee to um, sort of understand about emulation. You know, maybe as it pertains to your work, is there like one or maybe two key concepts that you um, help you would like people to to take away to help understand its utility? Um, um, I guess you know maybe it's more for the the practical application and again of uh, recognizing how um, especially in an academic library uh, where you have uh, many distributed roles um, that that uh, curation chain of command um, and getting as much information documented as you can up front if you're thinking about using emulation um, I think it's pretty pretty key from my point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for Eric or Fernando, is there, is it like something that just sort of comes up over and over and over again for you and your work, a roadblock or a communication well, obstacle? I, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll say it at Carnegie Mellon when we were doing this type of work and trying to legitimate it to to research scientists and things, right? Like the, the notion is that we actually needed better, we needed more use cases to show why this was viable and, and significant to 
generate the desire to actually get the work to happen, right? There's not an expectation in the research community that I'll be able to run a system from 20 years ago, mm -hmm. um, even in, like in CS, right? Like the, mm -hmm. the, 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 there's not this notion that you have this type of like executable past available to you. And if you did, like, I think that would change stuff, but there's not an understanding that that's like relevant or possible or even necessary. Chicken um, and egg supply and demand. <laughs> Um, as far as like the service, right? And I will say that when it worked the best, it was essentially the emulation just aspect of it was not really that visible or forefront, right? It was just, we got this thing running for someone and they were very happy um, that, it, that it worked, right? And it would be nice if that could keep, keep happening. Um, uh, is, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, it can, Fernando, do you wanna chime in with any last thoughts, squeeze you in? Oh yeah, just, uh, uh, just gonna quickly say, you know, tuning that language, of how you talk to emulation about with people of different backgrounds that might have different use cases, I think pretty critical. Uh, you know, making sure that uh, it's not too too tilted in, in one direction, like maybe archival or research data, but really showing, like Eric said, you know, those use cases, and then this is what you can do, and using the language that they understand. Well, thank you so much. We've hit the top of the hour, and I'm just so grateful to our panelists, and thank all of you so much for joining us today. Um, I'll remind everyone that the recording and the transcript from this discussion, this, excuse me, this discussion will be up on EZ's website um, to share more widely in about a week. Um, and we invite all of you to reach out to us um, directly on the EZ team. And, and one last thing I want to, 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 to plug is I'm really happy to encourage anyone who's left here today to sign up for our brand spanking new EZ community forum. Uh, this is a public discourse forum where you can follow along with announcements from uh, the EASY program, ask questions about the emulation as a service platform and the EASY services, um, or just continue this conversation that we're having today about emulation, legacy software, working with old material reproducibility. Um, and we hope it can be, you know, a space for people to connect, you know, these different uh, um, domains that we've been discussing, onlookers, um, digital practitioners, um, just everyone within this amazing community of practice that we're building in the easy circle. Um, so thank you one last time to Eric, Tracy, Fernando, um, and have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.